Anybody satisfied in this place today with Jesus? Hallelujah. I'm satisfied with you and you alone, God. You are our strength. Hallelujah. You are our portion. You are our portion. You are everything that we need. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, we bless you, Jesus.
church, I just worship him. Hallelujah. I'll see your goodness, Jesus. I'll see your goodness. I'll see your goodness. I'll see your goodness. I'll see your goodness. I'll see your favor. I'll see your favor. I'll see your favor. I'll see your favor. I'll see your goodness. I'll see your goodness. I'll see your goodness. I'll see your goodness. Hallelujah. I'll see your favor. I'll see your favor. I'll see your favor. I'll see your Oh, he is my 
Genesis 26. If you have a phone, you don't have your Bible, Google right quick Genesis 26, and it should pull right up for you. It should be the first option. <laughs> Click on that, and it'll bring you to today's chapter. So we're we'll talking about Isaac a little bit. Um, the word God dropped in my spirit <laughs> earlier this week, and um, I actually spoke on the title somewhat in October of last year, I believe it was. Um, and it was called Let's Go Digging. Um, and I dealt with that quite extensively from a different angle. And I dealt primarily with us uh, dealing with the vertical relationship with God so that we could be effective in our vertical and our horizontal. Thank you. And our horizontal, and our horizontal uh, as we are in tune with the Father daily, seeking Him, going deep, humbling ourselves, lowering ourselves, dealing before Him, not just in the physical capacity, but in our life, surrendering ourselves to Him as we kneel before Him, we get access into the heavenlies. We get access and get into a closer, deeper relationship with our Savior. So therefore, the higher we go up, the more access we have with Him, the more intimacy, connecting that we have with the Father, the more he can come and empower us. Then he empowers us, not so that we've got all this superpower just to stand still, but then we're able to reach out. Yeah. You're able to touch your neighbors. You're able to do and be the effective person God called you and made you to be. Yeah. So you're able to minister now because you got the vertical correct. Now you can do the horizontal correct. Okay? Remember, this thing that should be the thing for every Christian, for every believer. God made us, he called us to have dominion, right? What else? What are the three things? I'm trying to remember them verbatim myself. I know what they are, but in Genesis, God made man, he made him to have, to be fruitful, to Multiply and to have, there we go, goodness, we should know that, all right? To be fruitful, to multiply, and to have dominion. That just simply means that we are to produce. We are to produce. And you're to produce good things, you're supposed to produce the will of God here on the earth. Make it plain in the earth. Be, uh, uh, let it be on display in your life. Help others to understand that purpose of being here on earth. Everything that you do, the song you sing, the, the work you do, the attitude that you have, everything should produce God. You should be producing God, all right? So he made us to prosper, right? All right. And so we're going to today's lesson now, and God wanted me to deal with, uh, by highlighting some specifics of, in Isaac's story from the lineage of Abraham. Isaac is Abraham's son. Uh, who also bear a son, Jacob, you may recall, um, who later comes on the scene uh, after his mar Isaac's marriage to Rebekah. Uh, but we start here in the 26th verse. Uh, this is after Ishmael and Isaac have gathered together to bury their father, to give a proper burial for their father. Um, Ishmael and Isaac got together. And Isaac is then now left kind of wondering, and he ends up finding himself uh, back in the land of Gerar, Gerar, G-E-R-A-R, Gerar. He ends up back in the land of Gerar, which is owned or occupied by the Philistines. All right, by the Philistines. So we start here at the first verse. I'm going to read the first of the sixth verse. All right, everybody there? Amen. It says, there was a famine in the land besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. So there was a similar famine that his father experienced as well. Amen? Amen. Y'all scared me with these coughs and sneezes. <laughs> but I have to preach with my mask on. Amen. Amen. Hey, Glory to God. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, goodness. All right. There was a family in the land besides the first family that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Amalek, king of the Philistines in Berea. Our right, second verse says, And the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land which I shall tell you. 
So because of the famine in the land, Isaac was like, let's go. Let's ride out. I'm not trying to sit here and we ain't got no food, we ain't got no prosperity, we ain't got no water, we don't have access to anything that's going to bring us life. It's dead around here. Uh, so he was like, let's go to another land, and Egypt was nearby, but the Lord told him, don't go there. In the third verse, he said, dwell in this land, and I will be with you, and I will bless you for you and your descendants. I will give all these lands, and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham, your father, and I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. And I will give to your descendants all these lands. And in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. And the sixth verse says that Isaac obeyed. It says, so Isaac dwelt in Gerir. Isaac dealt with the same curse our situation, I say curse particularly because of the uh, phrase that we're used to hearing generational curses, right? Um, kind of like the same struggle that your parents went through, you end up going through in some kind of capacity. You understand where I'm going? All right. Uh, Abraham dealt with a famine. Isaac dealt with a famine. Abraham was tempted to leave the place that God told him to leave, but he ended up obeying, and God says that Abraham, your father, obeyed, so you should follow suit, and you should obey as well. So Isaac obeyed, and he stayed where God told him to stay, all right? So Isaac stayed, and he married Rebecca. He ended up finding favor uh, with uh, Rebecca's appearance. They brought, her to, they brought Rebecca to him and was like, look, did you want to marry her? He was like, oh, yeah, she's beautiful. That's Mary. So he married Rebecca. Um, and in the land that they were in, the career, Isaac told Rebecca a similar story or, or setup like Abraham told Sarah. He told Rebecca, when we get there, tell them that you're my sister. Because you're so beautiful. That if I tell them or you tell them that you're my wife, they're going to steal you and they're going to kill me. They did the same thing to Abraham. Abraham told Sarah, tell them you're my sister. Don't tell them you're my wife. All right? Big difference is, is that Abraham got away with it for a little while, but he ended up getting favor with Pharaoh. Uh, once he found out that God told Pharaoh, that, that was his, that Sarah was Abraham's wife. Y'all with me? All right. When God told Pharaoh, Pharaoh released Abraham of the attacks that would come up against him and told him, you're going to be protected. Don't worry. We're not going to take your wife. Okay? As a matter of fact, we're going to bless you. We're going to give you some stuff. We're going to give you some stuff. All right? But the difference here with Rebecca is uh, Amalek ended up seeing Isaac and Rebecca being intimate. Okay? I don't know why he was peeking in windows, but the Bible does say he saw through the window that Isaac was being friendly with his sister. He was like, something ain't right. So Amalek had to turn to the Lord like, what's up with that? You know, like, what's going on? And the Lord began to tell Amalek, well, that's his wife. And if you do harm to him or his wife, your whole land is basically going to experience a greater drought than the famine and, and going to experience basically damnation. Okay? So he ran up to Isaac and was like, hey, what's going on? Why did you lie and say that that was your sister when it was clearly your wife? Isaac, out of fear, and also because it was embedded in his nature, because his father did the same thing, the same practices, cutting around, cutting corners, Using the system because there's a lack of trust that God will do what he said. Mm. Can I talk about and expose their frailty, their weakness as men? Because some of us have done that in our life. Because we've cut corners. Mm -hmm. We've done things because we feel like we're going to get attacked if we don't present it a certain way. Yeah, right. But I'm telling you, God does not need for you to cut any corners. Yeah. Okay. I'm here to let you know that God doesn't need you to make a way. Because it didn't say that the Lord told Abraham or the Lord told Isaac to tell them that they're your sister. It is that they did it themselves. 
They did it in themselves, trying to create a way. And that's unfortunate what we do a lot of times in life, is instead of seeking the Lord for clear direction all the way through, we cut corners and we make ways. You don't have to do that. You can trust God. Because what ended up happening was, once Isaac did the fence, like, yes, that is my wife, I just didn't want the attack from y'all. He was honest. He had opportunity to be honest. He had opportunity to be honest. God will present opportunity for you to confess. Will you confess or will you keep a lie going? <laughs> Hallelujah. Will you keep a story going that is not, 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 not true, that God knows it has holes in your story? But if you bring that honesty, then prosperity can happen. The scripture says here in the 12th through the 14th verse, it says that um, then, then Isaac's, oh, let me get you to go up some. Actually, let me start at the 12th verse. It says here, Then Isaac sold into the land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. Hmm. Isaac sold into that land. And I believe a huge part of what he sold into the land was honesty. He yielded into that moment and said, this is the reality. Because the whole discourse that took place before the 12th verse was him talking back and forth with Amalek the king. Let them know, yeah, you're right. I didn't want you to put to death me and my, and my encouragement and all of that because this is my wife. And Amalek was like, man, you could have just been honest with me. He said, matter of fact, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to bless you. Amalek ended up blessing him and Isaac and, and all of his, his husband and all of that ended up giving them stuff. And so Isaac again sold into the land. He ended up staying in the land and he reached in the same year a hundredfold and the Lord blessed him. 13th verse says, the man began to prosper and continued prospering until he became very prosperous. Isn't that a scripture? The man began to prosper and continued prospering until he became very prosperous. All right, 14th verse, it says, For he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and a great number of servants. So the Philistines envied him. Envied him. My prayer is that we would get to a point of not trying to manipulate the way that God wants to bless us. Uh, meaning that we would allow God to be God and that with no apology. Uh, because what we tend to do is sometimes we try to hold off on sharing details of what God is doing for us yeah. because of the fear of someone envying us yeah. and misunderstanding what God is doing in our lives. Yeah. Wow. So we leave part of the story out. Yeah. We don't tell every detail because we fear them killing us in some capacity, killing our influence, killing our ability to continue to function, making or putting right on our parade. Causing us to be halted or stopped in our progression. But the Lord says that when I bless you, I add no sorrow. I add no sorrow. My blessings are yes and they are amen. My promises are yes and amen. So you don't have to fix it up for me. I'm your God. I'll take care of the situation. So I have to stay in the land. And he had unfortunately have represented himself for fear of harm coming up on him. Uh, so he only gave that. Amalek, he only gave him a version that he wanted him to see or think. Same issue that Abraham did. The intentions were good, but it wasn't cleared by God. There are literal things that you can do that you, there's not a bad thing. It's just God didn't approve it. You could be a good hearted person and still not leave, live for God. God's seal of approval is not on it. I did the right thing, but God doesn't get any glory. There are, times, there are times where you'll try to help God along the way uh, uh, and, and do so, but you're not walking in obedience. But God is requiring all of you. He wants your full self. Say, he wants all of me. He wants all of you. Amen. So, turns out that what ended up, ended up happening was that uh, Amalek, just like Pharaoh, ended up protecting and covering Isaac, despite the tension from the Philistines hating on Isaac. Let's go to the 17th verse. It says here, and we'll read 17 to 22. We're still in Genesis, the 26th chapter. It says, Then Isaac departed from there and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerir and dwelt there. He still did not go to Egypt. He was still in Gerir. 
Isaac dug again the wells of water which they had dug in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. He called them by the names which his father had called them. Also Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found a well of running water there. 20th verse, but the herdsmen of Gerera quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen saying, the water is ours. Let me go back a little bit. All right, around the 17th verse, 18th verse, it says here that Isaac pitched a tent. God told him to stay, he stayed. Then Isaac began to do something that his father had already done. It's like he honored the same pattern and path and work that his father did. In all your newness and all that you're trying to gain in life, you cannot forget the foundation that has been laid. You cannot forget the foundation. I know you want to do things different. I know we want to do church differently. I know we want to welcome in all the modern things or whatever, but we're going to end up uh, being so creative that we create God out of the picture. We're going to be so flashy that we end up flashing God right, right out of, out of his, his, his show, out of, right out of his opportunity to come and perform and be God because we want to be so up-to-date and so fancy and all these sorts of things. But that was an honor that he brought for what his father had laid, the work that his father laid. And he went and redug the, the wells that his father dug, and he named them exactly the same thing that his father named them. So even in the midst of your parents' hang-ups or whatever, if they led you to God, honor that part, because that was right. Even if they still hadn't gotten it together, honor that part, because that part is right. Don't go and try to create and reinvent the wheel and do something different. Amen? So Isaac dug the wells and named or renamed those wells what his father named him. And so here we have, as he began to dig the wells, the herdsmen of Gerar in the 20th verse begin to basically argue with Isaac, saying the water is ours. And so he renamed the well as Q because they quarreled with him. 21st verse, and then they dug another well. And they crawled over that one as well. So he called that one Sitna. And he moved from there and dug another well. And they did not quarrel over it. So he called it Rehoboth. Because he said, From now, for now the Lord has made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in this land. All right, everybody say with me, dig again. Dig again. One more time, dig again. The word that the Lord gave me for you today, Amir, is to dig again. Dig again. If you don't want anything else, dig again. All right? I know you're struggling over there, man. So, <laughs> I'm just glad you're in the house of the Lord. Amen? Yeah. Dig again. Your spirit man is eating it up. All right? <laughs> dig again. Dig again. Dig again. Dig again. God wants you to dig again. Here's a few things that he gave me about digging. All right? So as you can see, Isaac here. He's digging wells, and he is literally digging, trying to find a well that is just for him. Um, the previous wells that he dug, to bring honor back to his father's name, he had flack, he had uh, resistance. He dug another well, he had resistance. He dug another well, he had resistance. Some of you dug a well before, you had resistance. Things didn't go like you wanted. They didn't go as you planned, and all of a sudden you stopped. And you're like, guess what? This is not for me. Mm -hmm. I quit. Every time I try, every time I put forth the effort, something comes and takes away the significance of that for me. Mm -hmm. But the Lord says for you to dig again. This time, don't stop. But here's the significance of the digging. Here's the significance of digging. Digging has everything to do with you. It has everything to do with your ability to stay put. Mm -hmm. To stay put. Mm -hmm. That's one of the biggest issues of why some of us are not prospering. Because we won't stay still. We won't sit it out. We won't commit to that thing. We're looking for the next opportunity to be drafted off this team and put it to the next team. Mm -hmm. We want our position to just we're looking for the best setup for ourselves because the setup that I was in didn't favor me, I felt. So I'm looking for the thing that's going to favor me the way that I wanted to be presented a certain way for me. But God's 
says, stay where I told you to stay. He told Isaac, don't leave Gerir. Don't leave. Don't go somewhere else. Stay right where I put you. Stop trying to fit yourself to other situations and scenarios. As a matter of fact, build everything else around this scenario. Instead of you adjusting your whole life because this scenario you don't like anymore, you start trying to build a whole other scenario, then God will bring you all the way back around to the scenario that he ordained for you to be in. So here's what digging requires from you. Digging requires commitment, consistency, accuracy, and power. I'm going to go through them again. Consistency, commitment, accuracy, and power. Here's why the Lord needs commitment from you. He needs for you to have a made up mind. You gotta be committed. You gotta be made, you gotta have a made up mind. You may get tempted along the way. You may fall into a weakness along the way, but if you have a committed mind, God can do more with that committed mind and heart than he can do with you keep uh, moving and leaving from the place that he told you to stay in. So you have to be invested fully in the project. Uh, anybody ever heard of uh, Alcohol Anonymous groups? You ever heard of them? Mm -hmm. And it's weird because it makes sense in a worldly concept like that, but it don't make sense in the house of God. Nothing but the devil. All right. So here's the concept, all right? Get support. Yeah. Come to this group. Yeah. Admit you have a problem. Sit here because they're helping you to change your thinking. But you have to commit to the group. And if you're in the middle of the night, you get the chase. And you need to start thinking about that crowd and that volume and you start thinking about Hennessy and uh, all those things. Then what they want you to do is dial a number and say, hey, I need help. But in the church, when it comes to living and, and, and living for God, this ain't going to work for me. This ain't working. I'm just not good. I'm just too weak. I just got these hangups. It's just every time I try, I fail. Well, probably because you're not committed in the mind. And it causes you, if you're committed in the mind, listen, the pastor has to deal with this embarrassment. I'm embarrassed to say, but I fell again. I'm embarrassed to say, but I didn't do what I said I was going to do, pastor. I'm embarrassed to admit it, but you know what? Take that pride, because that's really what it is. It's really pride, because you're putting too much um, emphasis, you're putting too much pressure, you're putting too much, giving too much power to your own ability. But there's a reason why there's a shepherd. There's a reason why there's a person placed in front of you. There's a reason why a person is said it this way. Because sometimes we deal with There's a reason why there's a leader of the A and the A group. Because they've succeeded in some ways that you're still struggling through. And they're trying to aid you to a place of victory. So how are you going to have a conversation with the pastor and be like, but this is just what I need for my life and this just ain't working out. You done made up your own system. All right, let's get, come on, let's get back into the model. All right. Made up mind, invested in it. You got to be fully invested in it. You can't come in and then jump out. All right, let me keep going. Consistency. Consistency. So you have to have the momentum. You have to be like, I cannot be your hype man. I try, but I really successfully cannot be like, you have to be hungry enough for it. You have to be thirsty enough for it. You have to position yourself and put yourself in a place like as long as, as much as they want to help every person that's dealing with alcohol at the end of the day is really them. Do they really want this? I know you keep failing. I know you keep having uh, uh, re relapses. Uh, re I can't even get the word out. <laughs> I know you keep relapsing, but if you keep showing up, I promise you, you will get to a point of stability. If you keep putting forth the practices, they, you will get to a point of being able to see consistent victory. So you need consistency, which simply means to have the momentum, the ability to stay and remain until you break through. If you're digging, and you're digging, trying to get to something, you have to be committed to that spot. You can't start digging Get two feet in and be like, you know what, I don't, uh, there's too much sun over here. Let me go to another spot. You were probably close over there, but you just moved too soon. You weren't consistent. You got to stay. And I know it's monotonous. I know it's continuous of the same efforts, the same motion. But you got to keep digging until you break through. All right? Then accuracy. Accuracy. Uh, it's almost like chopping down the tree, Tasha. 
right in here, chop down the tree. You got an axe. But you unfortunately have to make sure to try to hit that same spot over and over again if you want to see that thing come down. You can't do it for a week. Leave. Give it time to grow. Give it time to heal itself. Because the tree is going to heal itself. It's going to strengthen back up. And so you come back and try to deal with that monkey again, and that thing is stronger. Because you keep toying with you're not consistent. You can't give up that thing because you're not staying at it. You keep leaving it, and they come back. And then I, oh, no, I want to get into old school teaching, not necessarily old school, but then you go and get seven more things and come back. You know? <laughs> but you're dealing with something that you're toying with, that you really are dealing with something. You're dealing with something that is dealing with demonic activity, unfortunately. And you are going back, and you're telling the devil, I don't take serious what God can do. So I'm coming, I'm receiving what you got for me. And you're like, well, I'm going to make it harder for you this time. And you get back over in freedom and you're free in God and all of that and stuff like that. And then you see the temptation. And instead of admitting, hey, I have weaknesses. Help me out. You just go back and you dance a little bit. Yeah. And then it's hard to get back to the fold. Mm -hmm. It's hard to get back to God. And then you start, unfortunately, like the problem of sudden, you start seeing yourself prospering and you feel it. Right. Right. And your worst self. We see our benefit, we see us benefiting more with not talking to people and dealing with people. But that's your ministry, people. Right. <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm better as a loner. Like, this is just the way I am. Yeah. Uh, but that's that, you're not healed, you're not whole, you're presenting a half self. You're presenting something, the false aspect of what you want people to believe. Uh, but God is not fully at work in your life. And you need power. Say power. power. You need impact and force. If you're going to keep at it, if you're chopping away at something, you need power. You need something. So that means you have to have a good appetite. That means you have to come and get the word of God. You cannot sit out here just willy-nilly, just out here talking about, devil, you're a lie. <laughs> that's not the only thing that's going to help you. Right. You need some word. Right. Jesus himself even had a word. He said, get thee behind me, Satan. Yeah. He said, man cannot live by bread alone, by, by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He had something more than just the power uh, uh, from uh, of, of words and just saying the devil is a lie. He had more than that. He said, you cannot tempt the Lord thy God. You cannot tempt me. And that's from the story of turning this, uh, the stone into bread. You might have known, been following me. All right. All right. So you have to have power. You have to have impact, impact and force, uh, which means you need girth and stamina. Uh, you will have to put your all into it. Say, put your all into it. Matter of fact, say, put my all into it. You have to put all of you into it. You cannot dibble and dabble. You cannot just put your toe in. You got to put all of you. If you're doing it, that's to tell you. If you're lifting weights, just go and don't try to prepare your back. And don't try to prepare, uh, prepare your uh, muscle. This area, with it. That area. <laughs> and this area too. Your stomach got to be right too. You can't just be loose talking about lifting up. It's going to all come down on you. But you have to gird yourself. Which means all of you. I think that's why it's so important even in worship that we give praise and worship from here. I know it seems like just a simple little thing. But no, no. It's hallelujah. Like all from here. Because it's like my whole soul is giving up everything to God. And it's required for me to be able to dig and get to what I need to get to in digging. Why is it important to dig? I see I need all those things, brother, pastor. Commitment, consistency. I need accuracy and I need power. I understand that. But why am I digging? What is the purpose of digging? Here's what's happening. You were excited. You praise God because something new came on the scene. Newness. Hallelujah. We ran around the church. New, 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 new. New, 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 new. Hallelujah. There's so much newness, right? The new world. I'm a new Christian, a new believer. Just newness all around me. Or I'm a new, it's a new life. Um, old things have passed away. All things become new. New, 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 right? With all this newness now, you have to settle in. You have to settle in because now provision is needed in this new place. Especially when you're in a new place where you're relying on what God has for you. 
what God has for you. You're relying on what he has for you. So that means you have to get planted. Get locked in. But if you get locked in somewhere where there's not any depth, you're going to die. You're going to die. It will be like sand. But the more you dig, the more you get access to water. The more you dig, the more you get access to oil or gas. And by these things, these minerals, these things in life, we're able to live. That's how cities were created. That's how townships were created. That's how any dwelling place was created. You see that random house in the country? It's just all this land and it's a random house because they're connected to some well nearby. That house would not be able to function if it wasn't a well nearby. In the desert land somewhere, you see a random house. It's because they are near a well that was dug. And if you get access to water, you can live. What does water represent? The Holy Spirit. Amen. Come on. Spirit. The Holy Spirit. It represents the Holy Spirit. So we have to dig. Dig, 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 dig again. You dug before. You experienced Christ before. You experienced Holy Spirit before. Guess what? It's time to dig again. It's time to dig deeper. So we need to dig because in order uh, to live, in order to be sustained, in order to have provision right where God has planted you, you must dig. You must dig. And then when you dig and lay that foundation down, you have to be sustained in that place. Go back to the well and draw. Go back to the well and draw. Draw from the well. Draw from the well. You need peace? Draw from the well. Do the work that's needed to get from the source that God has already blessed you to dig. Everybody say dig again. Dig again. Dig again. So we see here, as the story further went on in the 26th verse, it says here, uh, let me go and read. I think I stopped at the 21st verse. I want to read the 22nd verse again. It says, And he moved from there and dug another well, and they did not quarrel over it. So he called his name Rehoboth. and says, For now the Lord has made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in this land. The Lord wants you to prosper right where he has placed you. The Lord wants you to prosper right where he has placed you. Again, the Lord wants you to prosper right where he has placed you. Even strategically how he's placed us as Hope Nation in a new place, in a new region, in a new, uh, a new basically blank canvas in a sense. It's time to dig. It's time to dig. It's time to dig. Even in your life, you're going into newness. If you recall at the beginning of this chapter, the 26th verse, it says here, um, go back to the reading, it says, there was a famine in the land. All right, there was a what? Pandemic. One more time, there was a what? Pandemic. There was a famine in the land. A pandemic. We don't know what's about to happen. Not to talk about new variants and all that. As a matter of fact, saints start coming in with your mask on for a little while, all right? And keep it on during the service. We praise the holy name of God. Amen. <laughs> but let's, let's, go, let's mask up just, just for the next few weeks until, we, until they figure it out. We know who our healer is. We know who our savior is. We all go worship with our healing, but I just want us to be masked up for a while. All right? Amen. Because they, they don't know what's going on. They made something and don't know what to do with it. All right. Anyway, that's enough controversial stuff. But, uh, yeah, we don't know. So it's hard to almost prophesy and say, God's going to do this for you in 30 days. And when 30 days, we're going to all be on lockdown. But the God I deserve. When he speaks a thing, I don't care if you're on lockdown, that thing will still come to pass. Right. And he's telling us, even in the midst of a pandemic, even in the midst of uncertainty, even in the midst of all these things going on, to dig a well. It's going to work this time. I want you to just prophesy to somebody across the room and just tell them, say, it's going to work this time. It's going to work this time. It's going to work, so God just wants you to dig. Come on and say dig again. Yeah. It's going to work this time. So don't you give up. Don't you give in. Go ahead and begin to dig. While you're waiting on God, even in this pandemic, and it may look worse and it may seem silly to dig and to get that invested, to start that business, to continue to launch out in that business or whatever God is giving you. God is saying to dig. 
It's time to roll up your sleeves. It's time to focus in, to commit to this thing. Commit to what God has promised you. Let's stand to our feet. When we get out of church early, y'all, y'all want to sit back down or maybe in about 20, 25 more minutes? And he really sat down. I'm not... <laughs> like, I like that church. 60 minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We bow our heads. Person under the sound of my voice. Thank you for what they are doing um, and what you're doing in their life. I thank you for the desire and the recommitment to rebuild, to dig, and to trust you again, to trust you again, and to dig again. And be obedient to God. Um, come up close for me, Cameron, and um, let Shay come close. Dad, I want you to come up here for me. Y'all all come on up closer. Uh, Cameron and let Shay on this side. Dad in the middle for me right here. Um, I'm going to do something unique, Dad. We both ain't gonna understand it fully, but it's what God keeps telling me to do. And it's so funny. It's so funny because before I left the house, like I knew he had been telling me all week to do it, you know, especially when you called and told me he was coming for sure. And he was like, okay, now I'll do what I told you to do. And I was like, okay, God, you know, yeah, I'll do it. And then I was almost out of the house, and my wife said, hey, don't forget the oil. And she carries it around just so, you know, with all the shit that we don't want to lose it, it's a little bottle. So we don't want this to be just. I don't even try it somewhere. We forgot we didn't even know that. That's what, but anyway, this is what he told me to do, Dad. He told me to anoint you. Okay? After I anoint you, uh, one of the ministers is going to put oil on your hands. Okay? And then you're going to anoint me. Okay? No questions asked. No long story. No drunk. It's just we're going to do what God tells us to do. Man, but I know it's a blessing in a father's anointing. And it's almost like I'm, and I'm not saying grandpa never did, but it's almost like I'm going like grandpa should have done by laying hands on you. And again, you know, I ain't talking about grandpa. You know, I love grandpa. But you know, I love your dad. But it's like he should, but I'm, it's like I'm standing in his stand and I'm anointing you. And then you're passing that blessing on to me. Okay? Yeah. 
anyone else that desires prayer today, I do want to lay hands on the and TJ, so y'all come running. Come on, run up here, run up here, run up here, run up here, run up here. I 
want you to press your way. Come on, Saints. I need you to pray. I feel led to have you come in and uh, lay hands on the back, Victoria. Come on. Hallelujah. Big, big again. Big again. Hallelujah. Big again. Hallelujah. He's with you this time. Hallelujah. It's not by your own power this time. Hallelujah. God's going to restore the years that the enemy has tried to steal and eat away at you. Hallelujah. But God says that he's going to restore you. I'm not so. I'm just gonna play with her. I'll speak to you. I catch you. 